This video is brought to you by Blinkist. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com forward slash TIFO, T-I-F-O, will get one week to try it out for free. You'll also get 25% off the cost of full membership if you want it. More on them in a bit. On May the 30th, 1806, Andrew Jackson dueled with famed marksman Charles Dickinson, killing him after Dickinson insulted Jackson in a variety of ways, including calling Jackson's wife a bigamist. This latter point was a sore point for Jackson, as his wife really had married him while she was married to her former husband. She had separated from her first husband, Captain Lewis Robards, in 1790 and subsequently moved in with Jackson and began calling herself his wife. The two were soon officially married, but this was later nullified by the fact that she and Captain Robards had never finalized their divorce in terms of doing the paperwork, though the community itself considered them divorced. She had to remarry Jackson in 1794 once the divorce with Captain Rabards went through. Both Dickinson's father-in-law and Jackson at the time were horse breeders and rivals of one another. The beef between the two that eventually escalated to Jackson challenging Dickinson to a duel started in 1805 when Jackson had a $2,000, about $35,000 today bet with Captain Joseph Irwin, Dickinson's father-in-law, on a horse race. The winner would get $2,000 from the other, or if the horse won or the other bet on couldn't run, then that person would have to pay the other $800. Owen's horse did indeed not run in the race, having come up lame, while Jackson's horse, Truxton, did run, and so Owen was forced to pay Jackson $800. However, there was a disagreement between the two about which notes Jackson would be paid with. Later, Dickinson overheard a second-hand account of all things Jackson supposedly said about Owen over the matter and became angry at Jackson about it and fought with the person telling the story who was a friend of Jackson. Dickinson then sent Thomas Swan to ask Jackson whether what he heard was true, which Jackson denied, but in the process, Jackson physically attacked Swan and said he was a stupid meddler. Dickinson then wrote to Jackson, calling him a coward and an equivocator. This escalated to the point where the two were sending a series of insults back and forth, including publishing some in the National Review, such as this last one, which was the final straw, published in May of 1806, with Dickinson calling Jackson a worthless scoundrel, a poltroon, and a coward. After Jackson had called Dickinson a worthless, drunken blackguard. Despite the fact that Dickinson was known to be one of the best marksmen in all of Tennessee and dueling was illegal in that state, Jackson challenged him to a duel by sending him a note stating he wanted satisfaction due him for the insults offered. Because dueling was illegal in Tennessee, they traveled to Logan, Kentucky and dueled on the shores of the Red River. Jackson conceded the first shot to Dickinson, choosing not to fire when he turned, even though Dickinson was such a good marksman. He thought there was a good chance that Dickinson might miss, having to turn and shoot and try to do so as quickly as possible before Jackson could get a shot off. So if he did miss, or otherwise dealt a non-fatal blow, Jackson could then take his time and aim and kill him with the one shot he was allowed, as Dickinson would be required to stand still and give Jackson his chance. Things didn't quite go as smoothly as he hoped, and the shot fired by Dickinson hit Jackson in the chest, just a few inches from his heart, breaking two ribs in the process. Not to be dissuaded, Jackson stayed on his feet and carefully aimed at Dickinson and pulled the trigger, only for nothing to happen, as the hammer had stopped half cocked. So he re-cocked it and pulled the trigger again, this time hitting Dickinson in the chest. A few hours later, Dickinson died as Jackson had shot and damaged an artery. He was 26 years old and left his wife a widow, all over the silly he said, she said type of argument pertaining to her father's honor. All things being equal, we imagine Captain Irwin would have preferred his daughter still had her promising young husband around. Whatever the case, Jackson lived on and eventually became president, although because of the bullet's proximity to his heart, it could not be removed and it remained in his chest for the remaining 39 years of his life, reportedly causing him quite a bit of pain. Asked after the fact how he kept on his feet after a nearly deadly hit to the chest, Jackson replied, I should have hit him if he had shot me through the brain. The duel didn't endear people to Jackson, as many thought it was dishonorable for him to aim to kill Dickinson after he had already taken his shot, thinking Jackson should have instead simply aimed to hurt Dickinson instead, or even that he should have fired into the air to spare his life, thus ending the duel. This was not the only time Jackson had a rather colorful interaction with another human who slighted him, as we'll get into shortly in the bonus facts on what happens after someone tried to assassinate him, but before that, let's talk a little about today's fantastic sponsor, Blinkist. It might be a new year, relatively, but time management is just as hard as it ever was. And if you're like me, you've got plans to read lots of new books this year because you want to add that sweet knowledge to that big brain of yours. Unfortunately, reading takes a lot of time, energy, and attention, all things we're running low on. Fortunately, I have Blinkist. It's an app that offers easily digestible 15-minute summaries of all the best non-fiction books. There's more than 3,000 books in this app, and you can either read them 
or listen to them. Personally, I listen about 90% of the time, sort of just like a podcast, just fits into my day easily, walking to work, doing some chores around the house, that sort of stuff. Blinkist has 14 million active users who are getting the best insights and need to know info from thousands of books, from self-help to business to health, whatever you're into, it's on there. For example, on my Blinkist list for 2021, I have How Luck Happens by Janice Kaplan and Barnaby Marsh. It's all book on how to create luck for yourself. It's distilled down into, I think it's 13 minutes. Yes, 13 minutes of audio or about steady on. It's about 13 minutes, or if you prefer, you can read it. And look, you guys can try out Blinkist for free for seven days. There is a link below, and if you want the full thing after you're done, you can get 25% off. Again, seven day trial, there is a link below, or just go to blinkist.com forward slash T I F O. And let's get into that bonus fact. The first assassination of a president is both well-known and well-documented. On April 14, 1865, actor and Southern advocate John Wilkes Booth shot the 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, at Ford's Theatre. Lincoln died from his wounds not long after. Incidentally, shortly before this, John Wilkes Booth's brother saved Abraham Lincoln's son's life by grabbing him and pulling him back when Lincoln's son was bumped and was subsequently about to fall into a moving train as a result. In any event, less well-known was the next assassination of a commander-in-chief. On the 2nd of July, 1881, 20th U.S. President James Garfield was assassinated by Charles J. Guiteau. He did live for 80 days after being shot, but developed a severe infection from the gunshots, with a contributing factor possibly being several doctors who stuck their unsterilized fingers into one of the bullet holes to try and find the bullet that was lodged deep in Garfield's body. And do note that contrary to popular belief, much of the time it's better to leave the bullet in than try to remove it, even today, and back then even more so. His health gradually deteriorated until he finally suffered a heart attack and an aneurysm. Garfield was nearly assassinated earlier, but Guiteau lost his nerve after seeing the president's grief over his extremely ill wife. After Garfield's wife recovered somewhat, Guiteau followed through with his plan and shot the president. The next assassination of a U.S. president is also slightly less well known. 25th President William McKinley was shot by an anarchist, Leon Zolgost, on September 6, 1901. McKinley died from an infection caused by the bullet wounds a week later on September 14, 1901. After McKinley had been shot twice, his immediate action was to save the life of the assassin assassin who a mob had gathered around. He then asked for them to break the news gently to his wife. The two were extremely close and were almost never parted, particularly as she was epileptic and he liked to be around just in case she had a seizure. On the way to his funeral, his wife was, to quote one contemporary account, huddled in a compartment of the funeral train, praying that the Lord would take her with her dearest love. After the funeral, she set up a shrine in their home and regularly visited McKinley's burial vault. It was thought she wouldn't last long after his death, but she lived another six years before dying at the age of 59. On November 22, 1963, 35th President John F. Kennedy was shot in Dallas by Lee Harvey Oswald, perhaps a part of a conspiracy or perhaps not. He died shortly thereafter. Although Lincoln's assassination was the first, it was not the first presidential assassination attempt. This brings us back to the one and only Andrew Jackson. On January 30th, 1835, Andrew Jackson, the seventh and perhaps the most colorful of all the presidents, was attending a funeral when his life almost ended. The would-be assassin was Richard Lawrence, a painter who, at the time of the assassination attempt, believed himself to be King Richard III of England. In fact, Richard III, the last king of the House of York, died some 350 years before at the Battle of Bosworth Field, which is regarded by many historians as marking the end of the Middle Ages. This battle is also considered by many to have brought a close to the War of the Roses. In any event, around the time of the assassination attempt, Lawrence found himself out of work, something he blamed President Jackson for rather than his own insanity. He further thought that the US government owed him a significant amount of money, and if he could just kill Jackson, then it would be paid to him. He also felt that money would become plentiful in the US as a result of Jackson's death. Once he had his money, he planned to return to England, where he would take back his throne as King Richard III. The actual assassination attempt took place after a funeral that Jackson attended, that of Warren R. Davis a former representative from South Carolina. When Jackson was leaving the funeral, Lawrence stepped out from behind a pillar he was hiding behind, pointed his derringer at Jackson from about 13 feet and pulled the trigger. Reports state that the firearm went off, but the bullet did not leave the chamber. He then quickly discarded the first derringer and drew out his second and pulled the trigger. This time, Jackson was just a few feet away. Rather than run away or try to hide, which would have been contrary to Jackson's
Jackson's nature, Jackson charged this would-be assassin. The second shot reportedly went like the first with a loud bang, but no bullet exiting the chamber. Jackson didn't take kindly to this assassination attempt and subsequently attacked Lawrence with a cane. Others around Jackson also helped subdue Lawrence, including Congressman Davy Crockett, who incidentally was a staunch political enemy of Jackson, but nevertheless saw it fit to help him take down Lawrence. Some reports even state that Jackson had to ultimately be pulled away from Lawrence as he continued to beat him, even when Lawrence was down and subdued. Lawrence was subsequently tried, though not convicted, by virtue of his insanity. He was then placed in a variety of asylums for the rest of his life, dying 26 years later in 1861. Conspiracy theorists at the time felt that Lawrence's assassination attempt was not actually Lawrence's idea, but was instigated by certain of Jackson's political opponents, including Senator George Poindexter, who had hired Lawrence to paint his home just a few months before the attempt on Jackson's life. Indeed, enough people thought Poindexter was involved in the assassination attempt that many of his own supporters withdrew their support, and he was unable to get re-elected. Jackson himself thought Senator John C. Calhoun was the main person behind the attempt. In any event, speaking of President Garfield, due to being extremely poor thanks to his father's untimely death when future president James Garfield was just 17 months old, Garfield worked a variety of odd jobs to support himself during his education, including working as a janitor, a carpenter, and a bell ringer. Shortly after graduating from seminary, he took a position as a teacher and later sought higher education, attending Williams College. He then worked as a preacher, a principal of a high school, and a teacher of classical languages before getting into law and then politics. Garfield was also extremely poor during his short presidency thanks to the fact that the president was still expected to pay White House operating expenses out of his own salary, including funding expensive state dinners and things like that. This was partially how Thomas Jefferson had accrued so much debt in his lifetime. As most presidents were independently wealthy, this was not usually a problem. Garfield was not wealthy in any way, and even had to borrow a horse and buggy from former President Hayes to get about. Going back to Jackson, he not only was the first known US president someone tried to murder, but also is thought to be the first to be physically attacked while in office. The attack the attacker was Robert B. Randolph, and the attack happened about two years before the assassination attempt. Randolph had been in the Navy, but Jackson had him dismissed. Randolph later attacked the president, striking him and then running away when people around Jackson attempted to grab him. Randolph ended up getting away with striking the president scot-free, as Jackson didn't press charges. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to check out our fantastic sponsor Blinkist, who I'm linking to below, and thank you for watching.